This is the third um, lecture in our series on project finance um, for the launch of our project finance in healthcare masterclass. And I've started um, this lecture with a picture of a Netflix series. It's called um, Orange is the New Black. And it's about women in prison, basically, and all the drama um, that can happen in a women's prison. Um, but there's a part in this series where the prison gets taken over by a private company and the conditions get really bad. The food, um, the security services, the women experience a lot of abusive behavior and it ends in a horrible riot. And I think that that's kind of the overall sort of perspective that people have about um, private businesses getting involved in perhaps projects and services that they believe that should be the sole premise of government. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about, as well as project finance stru um, structures for public-private partnerships in this talk. So what is a public-private partnership? I've actually put my wedding picture here because um, public-private partnerships are not unlike marriages, um, in the sense that the World Bank defines a PPP as a long-term contract between a private party and a government entity for providing a public asset or service in which the private party bears significant risk and management responsibility and remuneration is linked to performance. Um, and I think I just wanted to emphasize the long term nature of these things. Um, so sometimes a public private partnership can last for 10, 20 years. Um, and obviously, in those kind of relationships, there'll be ups, there'll be downs, there'll be arguments, there'll be restructurings, there'll be you know, new ideas and innovations coming into that partnership. Um, but they're long term in nature. Um, and that's what makes them different from standard public procurement, or as in Nigeria, we call them contracts, where you just deliver and everybody sort of goes their separate ways. Um, in terms of public infrastructure, public infrastructure can be divided into two types. The economic infrastructure, like transport, trains, for instance, utility networks for water, sewage, electricity, and these are considered essential for day-to-day -day activities. And also social infrastructure, like schools, hospitals, prisons, like we spoke about earlier, um, that are considered essential for the structure of society. And then we can also draw a distinction between hard infrastructure, like buildings, and soft infrastructure, like services. Now, a lot of people ask, aren't some services supposed to be exclusively provided by government? Are there just some things that the private sector should not be involved in? When it comes to things like schools, education, when it comes to things like hospitals, when it comes to prisons, why should the private sector be involved at all? Um, and actually, the idea of involving the private sector in the provision of public services is not new. The states only took over the provision of these services kind of in the late 19th and 20th century. Prior to this, as most people that like are old can remember, most social infrastructure like schools and hospitals were actually provided by the church or private charities. And I don't know if people remember these Catholic hospitals, for instance, um, the Catholic um, schools. I went to a Catholic school that was run by the church. It was called uh, St. Mary's and it was um, an RCVAP school, which meant um, Roman Catholic voluntary aided um, primary school. Um, so the state only really took over those functions quite recently in the grand scheme of history. Um, I just wanted to talk about also the features of a PPP. Um, you know, you've got to partner with the public sector, and this is probably the most famous um, public sector figure um, across the world. Um, it's a long term contract, like I said, it involves the design, construction, financing or operation of public infrastructure by a private partner, party. Payments are made over the life of um, the PPP, either by public users, um, public, either by the public sector or users or both. And um, the facility usually remains in the public sector ownership, reverting to, um, it, to re or reverting to public sector ownership at the end of the contract. Terminology, you hear a lot of the terminology used in PPPs, BOT, BTO, B, um, DBFO. Um, and a build, operate, transfer is um, when you build the facility and you operate it, then transfer it back to government. A build, transfer, operate is when you build the facility, transfer it back to the private sector, but then um, operate it. Design, build, finance, operate. Um, again, that's self-explanatory when you design um, the project from start build it, then finance it and operate. So these are the sort of main sort of terminologies that you hear 
um, with um, public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships as an alternative um, to public standard public procurement. So PPP is an alternative to public sector procurement using tax revenues where they have to use their own money. Um, and particularly in Nigeria, the government doesn't have very much of its own money um, from tax revenues to use. So um, if you sort of are familiar with the uh, macroeconomic picture in Nigeria, in most developed countries, um, the tax to GDP ratio, that's the amount of tax that they're able to get from the GT, uh, GDP of the country is around 35%. In Nigeria, it's 6%. So using tax revenues in Nigeria is not really an option. Even in Afghanistan, that has been at war, the tax to GDP ratio is 9%. So we actually have very little in the way of tax revenues to be able to um, use to um, provide public services. Um, so in standard procurement, the public authority has to fund the full cost of construction, including any cost overruns. Whereas PPP decreases the risks related to construction, operation and maintenance and the standard of services. And then the private sector can also bring expertise, it can also bring finance, it can also bring its efficiency um, to a project. Um, so what kind of things um, in terms of your investment analysis, um, if you're doing a PPP, do you have to look at? PPPs deal with cash flows over a long period of time. And as we all know, a dollar right now is very different from a dollar in five years time. So the two most important things to look at is the DCF, the Discounted Future Cash Flow Calculation, which gives a value today on net present value for future cash flow, and the IRR, which is the determined overall rates for a return on investment based on its future cash flow. And the spreadsheet is used to calculate both. Um, so there's a few different PPP um, programs and policies in different countries. Um, probably the most famous in the world is the UK's PFI, Private Finance Initiative Project, which was used, like I said, in the NHS case studies in the last um, presentation. The United States, the biggest PPP sector in America is waste and water. 15% of municipal systems um, use PPP to, for their water and waste. Um, in Australia, things like big projects like the Sydney Harbour Bridge were PPPs. And um, France has a long history of PPPs as well, and um, Korea. Um, actually started to encourage um, private participation in, um, in the Infrastructure Act, and then they went through a crisis. Um, but then, you know, there was a resurgence of PPP after that. Um, PPPs often use project finance methodology to fund um, transactions. It benefits both the public and private sector, and benefits the public sector due to the lower cost and increased transparency. So um, in this lecture, we've looked at PPP as it relates to uh, project finance, as it relates to PPPs. We've looked at the investment analysis. So we've looked at um, sort of the role of DC, DCF and IRR. And we've looked at different countries and the different policy reforms that they've gone through um, to promote PPP. Thank you very much.